things that I found just like Jay on the side of his hiking trail. <laughs> I still have those if you want. <laughs> not real human remains, but two scale human remains that we'll be using as we start learning the upper extremity anatomy. So that you can have a hands on model to look at as we start memorizing these body parts. But before we get to that, we gotta wrap up the rest of this review really quick. We left off on long bones. And there is a quick review, once again, of all of our long bones, where they're located in the body. I'll highlight it in red. That's the majority of our appendicular skeleton. That's what's on most of those models sitting there in front of you, except for the carpal bones, of course. Carpal bones are those little tiny wrist bones. Those fall under the short bones. But the majority of those are going to be long bones right there in front of you. They have those two epiphyses on the ends, diaphyses in the middle. They have a compact bone on the outside with the spongy bone on the inside. And then, of course, that medullary cavity in the middle, helping to create that bone marrow. Can't see the periosteum on those models, but you can kind of imagine that with your imagination, that little thin sheath wrapping those bones, those attachments, those blood vessels. Next bone classification, the irregular bones. We will talk about most of these in Rad Pro 3, but there is one in particular we'll talk about at the end of the semester, that being your pelvis. So your vertebrae, your facial bones, and your pelvic bones all fall under, all under what we call the irregular bones because they all have very unique shapes. They don't share any shape with one another. They're all very unique. Just like this right here, this is a C vertebrae that we're looking at right here. Very irregularly shaped. C vertebrae are the only ones that look like that. They don't look like T vertebrae. They don't look like L vertebrae. They don't look like facial bones. They're unique in shape and appearance. Also, um, your previous class pointed out to me that this looks like Sid the Sloth. Oh, it's just right there. <laughs> yeah. So you have a bunch of Sid the Sloths in your neck. If you look at them in the axial view. I can't, I can't ever unsee it, you know. Sid the Sloth on Ice Age. I always say That's going to be your irregular bones. Yeah, I want to kind of look like a fish a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, fish looking at you. like the little... A little bit on square with the nuts in his mouth. Yeah, yeah. So there's those irregular bone examples, guys. We have, of course, what I said, the facial bones, the majority of your spine, well, really your whole spine, your sacrum, your coccyx. And, of course, they don't have it highlighted, but those pelvic bones as well fall under the irregular bones variety. And that's going to be mostly your axial skeleton that fall in that irregular bones category, except for those pelvic bones. Those are part of the appendicular skeleton. <coughs> and you said, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that, you said that should be highlighted, the allies should be highlighted too? Yeah, the pelvic bones should also be red on that picture. I thought that was a black bone. Right? They are not. They are actually irregular because they're the only ones that actually share that common shape. Yes. A few more examples there, guys. There is an example of another C vertebrae right here, a little bit different than the one we just looked at, because this is going to be your C1, also called the atlas. Does anyone know why it's called the atlas? Fun little bit of trivia there. You know, want to know about Greek mythology? Yeah. yeah. The atlas had the weight of the world on his shoulders. The atlas holds your head on top of it, otherwise it would just flop off, flop off your body. That's why it's called the atlas. Of course, there is those spinal vertebrae. We're not going to be memorizing any of this yet, just showing you some examples. The one we have went over is, of course, that hyoid bone. It also is considered an irregular bone. Remember, that's what they look for when someone hangs themselves. They look for that to be fractured. Short and flat bones. So short and flat bone. This will be our carpal and our tarsal bones. Those are going to be our short, specifically, carpal and tarsal. And then the flat bones are going to be what we call the calvarium, the sternum, the ribs, and the scapula. Those are our flat bones. So calvarium is the area of your skull, pretty much the sides and top of your skull, because it's very flat and rounded. That's your calvarium. Sternum, of course, you all know where that is. Ribs is the one people often forget. Ribs are considered flat bones. They're actually very flat in shape and appearance if you actually look at them up close, even though they're quite elongated. And of course, the scapula. The scapula are flat is as well. Is that the picture of the calvary? Huh? The picture of the Yeah, so calvary would be like the top and the sides of your skull, the cranial cap, essentially. Not to be mixed up with those facial bones in the front, those are irregular. Is the calvarium separated by region of like the brain it protects? There are they are different sections, yes, but 
we will hit that in Rad Pro 3. And yeah, let's not talk about that yet. Like, that gets scary. All that. all that gets scary. Mm -hmm. That's the scary stuff. Wait, what gets scary? The head work. Mm -hmm. That's where the anatomy gets a little scary, but we'll, we'll get to that next year. But carpal and tarsal bones, once again, those are going to fall under that short bone variety. Short bones. But you can see some of those carpal bones with your little skeletons in front of you. That's those little wrist bones. I'll consider short bones. There is some more examples there, guys. Wait, I'm sorry, that picture is not correct. Oh, Hang on. No, I want that don't, don't write that down. That picture is inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> There's some more of those short bones there, guys, with carpals. And they are also sharing that aspect of having the compact bones around the spongy bone. They just lack the diaphyses on the ends that the long bones have. These are very short and circular in nature. So you can see highlight on the skeleton, the wrist bones, the tarsal bones, and also the patellas are sometimes referred to as short bones, but they actually fall under another category that we call sesamoid bones. Patellas are your kneecaps, by the way. But we're not going to call them kneecaps anymore. They're called patellas. Now, get rid of those layman terms and use the scientific terms. I saw a post yesterday in the sound position. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say yeah. there were a lot of sunrays yesterday. Very common to view, yes. Just some more of those flat bones there, guys, up close. There's that calvarium we talked about, or the cranial bones. Very flat and rounded in nature. The sternum, of course, in the front. The ribs once again, and then the scapulae on your back of your shoulders, your shoulder blades. But we're not going to say shoulder blades, we're going to say scapulae. We're not going to say collarbone, we're going to say clavicles, right? We're not going to say breastbone, we're going to say sternum. And speaking of sesamoid bones, there we go. So sesamoid bones, they're going to be oval shaped in nature. And they're embedded with tendons that actually develop due to friction. So your areas of your body that have the most friction to de develop the sesamoid bones. Now we have the largest in the body, the patellae, once again. Patellae is plural, patella is singular. They are considered the largest sesamoid bones in the body because, of course, there is great friction in our knees. We move our legs constantly. But you'll find sesamoid bones throughout the body, um, near the toes, where the toes flex. And of course, in the fingers as well sometimes. People that work with their hands a whole lot, like do a lot of manual labor, they'll have sesamoid bones all around their fingers because of all the increased friction of using their hands constantly. Feet, of course, are going to develop them quite a lot because we walk on our feet all the time, so that's a lot of friction there. And like I said, our knees as well. Y'all see them right there? Mm -hmm. So the way I always remember those, they look like little sesame seeds, you know, like sesame seeds on a bun. Sesame seed bones, sesamoid bones. Sounds silly, but you won't forget it now. Little sesame seed bones. Is that the same thing? Mm -hmm. As a what? As you know, the, I don't know what they call it, but you said bunion. A bunion? No, no, you don't, no, bunions are bad, no. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, let's just show you how those tendons will actually attach. So you can form new tendon attachments, depending on what area of your body has increased friction on it. So uh, some people have more tendons than the other, depending on how much they work those joints and those areas of their body. When you're more really athletic people, they're gonna have more sesamoid bones in certain parts of the body as well, which you'll see on x-rays. Those of you that don't exercise at all, like myself, you know, <laughs> lacking in sesamoid bones, but I could use some more sesamoid bones. They need to start exercising again. Um, there's an example of one on the thumb, by the way circular bone. You'll see that one quite commonly. Thumb is used a lot more than our other digits, but you'll sometimes see them forming around the joint spaces of the other phalanges. Especially, like I said, people when they do a lot of manual labor with their hands, they have those increased amounts of sesamoid bones in their hands. And there's just, you know, some of y'all saw this yesterday, yes? Those knee views. There's that largest sesamoid bone in the body, the patella, superimposed on that AP view there. You can barely see the outline of it right there. In the side view showing you the joint space between the femur and that patella. All right, so bone development, just uh, briefly go over this once again, guys. When it comes to bone development, that is the process basically there. Ossification is the fancy way of saying bone development. We have what's called primary ossification and secondary ossification. Just know that that is terminology of the process of bone forming. You don't need all the details of how that works. 
Diaphysis is the ends of your bones as they're forming. Epiphyses, I'm sorry, diaphysis is the middle of the bones, like the long shaft. Epiphyses are the ends of those long bones as they're forming. Fusing together to make those growth plates, also called the epiphyseal plates. And then metaphysis is another process taking place in the medullary cavity within the bone. Just know that is part of ossification. You don't really know, you know all the complex details of that unless you just want to know. Metaphysis is part of the ossification process. Did anyone do any by, uh, anybody see any growth plates on anybody on x-rays? Not yet? You will, and like I said last semester, sometimes people will mistake those for fractures, but they're not. It's normal, it's supposed to look like that, especially your youth and your kids. But you can see in adults as well, it's a little ossified line. Some are more prominent than others. So you'll notice that on a lot of your long bone x-rays. Mm -hmm. You did see some yesterday? You knew what they were? No? They put like a metal ball next to it. It's because it looks weird in the... Oh, they see some next to it. I'm not sure why they do that. They do that to the some, some doctor likes that, from what I hear. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what purpose that serves. What is it? They put like a little metal ball by knee x rays on some clinics. Oh, if you can find out what that's for, I still I asked it. him to fix it. I don't no know. one knows. Yeah, like, no one knows why they do that. that. Why? It's just some doctor likes it, apparently. It's the only thing I heard. They said something about surgery. Now, you don't need to know this, guys. It's just showing you how that ossification process works. It's just a nice little pretty diagram. You know, as you start as a baby and you develop to an adult, you see how it starts out as purely cartilage with a little bit of ossification center and then it grows and grows and grows until you form that full medullary cavity with the vessels going through it, your spongy bone, your compact bone surrounding it, forming that entire adult bone that's nice and strong and can hold the weight of your body. And there's the definitions, guys. This is as much as I need you to know on these terms right here. So you can go ahead and write those down, take a picture. We're not gonna get fully into the ossification process. That's, that's back for, um, you know, grade school and, you know, biology in college. As far as x-ray goes, this is all you can know on these definitions right here. So ossification, that's your natural process of bone formation. Primary ossification is the first area that starts ossifying. Secondary, of course, the second area that starts ossifying. Diaphysis, that shaft or central part of the long bone. Epiphyses, the ends of the long bone. Then your epiphyseal plates, also called your growth plates. And then metaphysis, the wide portion of the long bones and the regions of the bone where growth occurs, typically near that medullary cavity in the center. Luckily, they don't ask a lot about ossification on your registry. That's about the extent of what they'll ask you right there. Just a little bit from, from yeah, from what we're learning on this PowerPoint. Yeah. You always see a little bit of that mixed in with all your red pro. Yeah. Especially with joints. That's a big one because you're gonna learn new joints for every chapter. I thought there was a bunch of joints here. And the bone shapes. I'll get to the bone shape, that's a big one. Let's just show you another close look at those epiphyseal growth plates. Once again, you'll learn how to identify those because I don't want y'all to embarrass yourself and say, oh, look at that fracture. But it's, you know, a normal growth plate on youth or even adults, like I said. Some people ossify slower than others. And then some of the ossification centers you can still see as an adult. You can see that fused line where that bone actually fused together. It's not a fracture, it's a growth plate or epiphyseal plate. It's supposed to be there as that cartilage shrinks away and the bone fuses together few more there, showing you the difference. There's your open, it's a lot blurrier than I thought it was going to be. Open growth plate and then your fused one right here, which you can barely make out that little line going across. The quality of that is not so great, I apologize. All right, joints. 
here we go. So this should look familiar. We did go over this last semester. We have what we classify, jo we classify joints by structure and of course by function. The three main structures are gonna be your fibrous, your cartilaginous, and your synovial. That's your structure. Fibrous means just what the word says. It's held together by that fibrous tissue. Cartilaginous, held together by the cartilage. And the synovial has that synovial capsule containing that synovial fluid. Anyone see any arthrograms yesterday? By any chance? If you have it, you will. They're quite common. And of course, you have your function. You have your synarthroidal. Remember this? Look familiar? Synarthroidal is immovable. Amphiarthroidal is limited movement. And diarthroidal is freely movable. Do not forget these six terms. As we go through each chapter, even with upper extremities that we're about to start here today, we're going to start classifying all these joints by structure and by function. We've got to make sure these terms are fresh in our mind that we know what they mean. Or you're going to get lost in it. There's a lot of joints in the body. So diarthroidal, probably the most common that we see throughout the body. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to move around. We wouldn't be able to talk, we wouldn't be able to chew. Move your fingers, your feet, your toes, any of that. So structure versus function. And of course, we do all those classifications within the synovial joints. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? Like your hinge joint, your gliding joint, ball and socket. We're going to review all those briefly as well. That is a large part of what we learn on the epidendular skeleton. Mostly it's synovial joints. Mostly diarthroidal as well. It's a little easier to remember. It's a really great chart to remember there, guys. So do the arrows go? So that's the structure right. going down, okay. function going down. It's just showing you this is all related to structure, yeah. this is all related to function. All right, so there's just a few examples of those fibrous joints. Once again, guys, y'all remember this? Especially the sutures in the skull, because what did I say last semester? We don't want our skull shifting around. If it is, you might want to get that checked out. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be losing any brain tissue over the next two years. Yeah. Your skull should be nice and fused, same with the roots of your teeth. Hopefully your teeth aren't falling out. If they are, you might want to go to the dentist and get that fixed. But that would be another example of a fibrous joint because we need our teeth to stay in place so we can chew. We don't want those moving around. And there is one that we're going to talk about this semester right here, guys, that connects the tibia and the fibula together. That's the distal tibiofibular joint. It's one of the few fibrous joints we'll talk about this semester when we go to lower extremities. That's one that people often forget about right there. So that joint in particular does not move. Even though you can move your ankle around, that's multiple joints coming together. But the one between the tib and fib, it's fused. It cannot move. People didn't realize. I mean, I didn't realize when I until I was in school that the roots of the teeth are a joint. People don't realize that's actually considered a joint. Mm. Are teeth considered bones? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. All right, let's just show you a little closer look there, guys. There's what those sutures look like up close. There's that fiber. Those fibers between the um, the radius and the ulna. I don't know what cotton should not be in that picture. Ignore that one in the middle, guys. That picture should not be there. That's the... That's, that's radius and, that's radius and ulna. Ignore the picture in the middle. I'm sorry. And then the roots of the teeth right there. Guys. By the way, this is why we switch books. So this is from the past book, bond the Bond Trigger book. They have a lot of inaccuracies in the Bond Trigger book, which is why you're learning out barrels now. So if I ever have an old picture and I say don't worry about it, if you take a picture, put an X on one, until you put an X on because there are some inaccuracies in there. So A and C would be your examples right here, guys. Cartilaginous joints, the ones held together by cartilage, probably some of the ones that we know the most about. Between the vertebral bodies, it allows that nice cushion between those vertebrae to absorb impact. It allows us to have some flexibility with our back. Some of us are more flexible than others. I used to be a lot more flexible than I am today. Uh, but you can work when you work out when you exercise that cartilaginous joint can become a lot more flexible Which is why you can see some people bend and do something Okay, thank you We have the symphysis pubis another very well-known cartilaginous joint that needs to be flexible for the purpose of y'all remember? Childbirth, correct childbirth 
and then we have those epiphyseal plates. When before they fuse, before they ossify, they are considered cartilaginous joints in children. Epiphyseal plates. And then the big one for this semester, guys, of course, the synovial joints, the ones we're going to talk the most about this semester. They're characterized by that joint capsule and containing the synovial fluid, allows those joints to be freely movable, or scientific term, diarthroidal. I'll show you an example of a very badly jarred knee joint there. Because the cell is missing. <coughs> but all your synovial joints have that beautiful little capsule surrounding it, which is why people have to have those arthrograms done where they come into fluoro and they inject contrast into the capsule, they light it up and they see if this capsule is nice and filled with fluid or not. It has that nice cushion still. Otherwise, what we talked about last time, those bones can rub up against each other to erode, causing a lot of pain and stiffness in your patients. I um, had a patient yesterday that had no, no gap at all. It was just, just fat patella and just straight up bones connected. Yeah, yeah, if you can imagine, it can be very, very mm -hmm. uncomfortable and painful. A lot of people have that knee pain, they get those knee replacements. His, uh, that's the reason. His chart said he was at a pain level eight. Pain level eight. I'll show you what it looks like in your elbow there, guys. There's your humerus connecting to the ulna right there. We're gonna learn some of that today. And then last part of this review, guys, let's go over those synovial joint types one more time. We have, of course, our ball and socket joint. What's an example of that? Who remembers? Shoulder. The, shoulder. the shoulder and the it's color coded up here, guys. Here. Oh, yeah. Your hinge joints, which would be like which ones? Elbow, elbow. elbow. and knee, because it works like a hinge. Your pivot joints. Okay. And you go like, Mr. Donnie, please don't give me any more information or any more tests. Swing your neck like this. It's pivoting. Gliding joints. Your wrist, your wrist. How about that saddle joint? We have one, y'all remember what it was? Hopefully y'all are giving me thumbs up instead of pivots. <laughs> Use your saddle joint more than the pivot joint. And then the condyloid joints, that's gonna be overlap. You don't see it color coded, um, but we have a condyloid joint here where our radius and only connect, but also in the knee and also in the jaw. So I'll show you all that as we move forward here. Is that this one? Correct, where the TMJs are. Correct. So just uh, just briefly, guys, one more time. The plane joint or the gliding joints, that's going to be your wrist, the most common one that we talked about. We also have some up near the clavicle. We have what's called an AC joint that connects the acromion of the scapula to the clavicle. That's also considered a gliding or plane joint. I'm giving you both names, by the way. Make sure you know both because um, depending on what you're looking at, different exams, they may use these names interchangeably. So the gliding joint can also be called a plane joint. We're going to expand on these a little bit more moving forward. Gliding or plane joint. Most commonly we're looking at those ones where all those carpal bones are because they glide over each other. Hinge joint has a very mouthful of, word, of a word that they also classify it as. We have the ganglionous or hinge joint. Most people like to say hinge because ginglemus is a mouthful. Try to say that 10 times fast. It's kind of a tongue twister. Ginglemus, ginglemus, ginglemus. That's going to be your fingers and your elbow joint. So when we move our fingers like this, that is a hinge action. When we flex our arms like this, that's also a hinge action. And you also have the hinge in our knees. It's actually shapes like a hinge. Ginglomus or hinge joint. You realize your fingers bend like that. You do this, you can see what see what that picture's showing me. The human body is quite fascinating when you break it apart. All right, that pivot joint goes by another name called the trochoid joint. Pivot or trochoid. We talked about the neck, but we also have a pivot joint. In our forearms, if we turn our arms like this, and if we turn our legs as well, that's a pivot action. Anytime you're turning, turning your head, turning your arms, turning your legs, that's a pivot joint. 
or trochoid joints. So that's what we were just talking about, guys. There's that atlas. Pull that vertebrae out. Head goes, falls off your body. You get a nice internal decapitation, as they say, which is a real thing. I've seen a couple of those. It's where the head's actually detached from the C-spine, kind of just dangling. We have to um, isolate the head, otherwise, when you think about it, it could cause massive damage to the brain or the spinal cord. Is it that metal? Yeah, they'll put that metal apparatus. I saw one yesterday. Yeah. It's like they a baby. It's called a halo. I got to see the separation, too. Yeah, it's called a halo. Yeah. Yeah. Does it move around like a baby? Like when you pick up a baby, they're like a little <laughs> Well, that's not why a baby's head flops around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John. Um, that's just, uh, that's your that's the poor baby not having the strength to control their head. Right? <laughs> no, I'm saying, is it, is it like the baby? Is it similar to how I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like if that's missing, yes. I misunderstood you, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's have a brief, let's have a brief patient care lesson here, guys. Whenever, we're going to pretend this is a baby. <laughs> Anytime you pick up a baby, always support their poor little head. <laughs> always pick them up with a head going like this. I can see um, him doing it now. Very, very experienced parents. And I He's like, this. look, it was my knees and I, I scare, scarily saw this more often than I would like to admit. I took the children from inexperienced parents. They pick their baby up, hold them like this, and their head's like flopping down like this. Just shaking around. I'm like, like no, no, sir, please support your baby's head. Like, yeah, you can cause... <laughs> damage like that. Like, Always support the baby's head. They don't have the strength to hold their head up yet. That's something that comes oh, in a few, yeah. few months as they start growing. Yeah, support that little cranium. They're, they're like they were shaking their head. Yeah, they do. They're or something. Yeah, they do. All right. <laughs> Condyloid joints. Condyloid joints. That's going to be specifically your joints and your knuckles. Condyloid joints. Those are our ellipsoid. Also called your lip soil. So when you crack your knuckles, you're cracking your condyloid joints. By the way, it's not unhealthy to do that, despite what they've told you. That does not cause arthritis. When you crack your knuckles, you're simply releasing air. Can't crack them out. There we go. You're releasing air from the joint space. That's all you're doing. It's not a bad thing. It does not cause arthritis, no matter what your grandma tells you. So you just didn't like hearing it. Hmm? You just didn't like hearing it. That was the reason of telling people not to do it. Don't like hearing I think they just didn't like the sound, yeah. <laughs> or just one of those old wives' tales, you know, as they say, those little myths. My uncle, used to, tell, my uncle used to tell me don't whistle because a hen doesn't do, do something. I'm like, what? Um, yeah. All right, sell our joint. There's only one in the body. That's the one that connects the thumb. Allows that fully opposable thumb to move in any direction. It's your cellar or saddle joint. Cellar or saddle joints. It's actually shaped like this, guys. It's like two little cups coming together. It allows that fully flexible thumb. Some people can like move their thumb really. It's not like bend their thumb against their wrist. I've seen that before. Yeah. Double jointed people. Yeah. Double joint people always creep me out. I always hate seeing that stuff. Yeah, because they don't do something with their arm. Yeah, yeah. Then the most common, the one we know the best, guys. Are you double jointed? Yeah. yeah. Oof, it gives me chill bumps. Do it. Do it. Oh. 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 I cannot. No, I don't get squeamish. I don't get squeamish with a lot of stuff, but that has always made me squeamish when I see that. I don't know why. So, double joint people and anything with teeth. Anything with teeth makes me squeamish. Teeth? Yeah. What do you mean? Teeth? I have very sensitive teeth, so anything with teeth just like. Like when they grind teeth or something? Grinding teeth. Just come in with ice cream and bite. Jaws that pop. Um, even just going to the dentist, like when I go to the dentist, I'm like gripping the side of the chair, like <laughs> white knuckle, because who hurt you? I have very no one, no one hurt me. I just have very sensitive teeth, so when they're using that little pickaxe, I call it the pickaxe, and they're picking at your teeth, it's just like it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. I'm like sweating and, and it's torture for me. That little frog. Yeah.
It's called bruxism. It's called bruxism. If you grind your teeth too much, you're going to call gum recession. And you don't want that because you'll lose the integrity of your fibrous joints in your teeth and lose your teeth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question. On the, because uh, I suppose you're okay, the double jointed and stuff. And I understand we're talking about the joints. Can you just, what do you mean exactly by double jointed? What do they have in there? Oh, that's that's not an accurate term. That's just oh. what layman's term. <laughs> it's, it's just a flexibility of the synovial cavity. Some people have very flexible oh. synovial mm -hmm. cavities, others do not. Okay. Oh. So yeah, it's not an actual double joint. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. I missed that two times. Yeah. Um, so then what, what then would be the difference from like dislocation and having that flexibility after um, than like being du double jointed? Because like I dislocated my right shoulder and I'm using snuff tests. I don't have an answer for that one. Huh? I, 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 I'm not sure on that one. Okay. I wasn't sure. That's a good, like, that's a good thing to research though. Different, yeah. Ball and socket, guys. Humerus to shoulder, femur to pelvis. Got that ball in the actual socket. Some of you have a full um, arm in front of you. You see that ball and socket in action right here? It's an actual ball going into a socket. It allows you to move that arm around. Very commonly dislocated area of the body. You see a lot of dislocated arm. They have to pop that arm back into place. It makes a very disgusting noise, by the way. Even the hip, right? Yeah, the hip as well. <laughs> That's a very rare exam, by the way. Yeah. 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 Speaking of TMJs, that's considered a bicondylar joint, and sometimes the knee overlaps into that joint as well. So the knee can also be a bicondylar joint. Okay. We'll overlap with that joint. But the main one for bicondylar is your TMJ as the mandible fitting into the temporal bone. The mandible fitting into the temporal bone. Thus, TMJ, temporomandibular joints. You'll find most of your joints are the union of two words, the two bones coming together. The easiest way to remember joint names, they always, almost always are classified by the two bone names combined. Yes? My friend at work, she's always Yeah, I hate, that, that's one of those things that gives me chill bones. I always yeah. ask her why, but yeah. she never, like, tells me, like, she doesn't have knowledge of talk. It feels uh, better. Her synovial cavity needs some work. That's mm. why it's popping. Yeah. And she always goes like that, and then, like, she goes like that. Really yeah. All right, so one more time, guys. Yeah. There is your classifications yeah. of your movement types. Once again, remember these terms. As we move forward in Rad Pro 2, we're going to talk about all the joints and how they fit in these categories right here. So there's your main synovial joint categories based on movement type. Let's get make sure you're memorizing those. We're going to use those terms a lot moving forward. There's seven. Yeah. There's seven, correct. We did not talk about the bicondylar we last chapter of last semester. Oh. That's one more that I forgot to add in there. There's an oversight on my part. And that's both Bye. names for you, both both names for each of those joints. yourselves a quick 10 minute break guys come back at well I'll give you 13 minutes come back at 925 and we're going to start our first chapter Isn't that okay?